Daniel, so I guess up to you guys. Uh, what order you want to go in? Daniel, maybe you might be in a good position to sort of overview sort of the Divi program what's available, and then we can transition over to Steven. And then we actually have um, Frank Hebert, as uh, as Juan mentioned, uh, ready to join us via satellite um, uh, to talk about the, some of the stuff that went on in, um, in New York last week, which I assume you is that you mentioned you were yeah, also there. Exactly. Okay, cool, awesome. So. Um, well, yeah, why don't you go ahead and get us started? To introduce the Divi Bank program? Oh, sure. I think they already gave, I think yeah, the overview was already given. I'm definitely not the data guy, so Daniel's this person that you really want to talk to. Yeah, but, so, uh, no, I was just going to say, we're going to, you see a map of 75 stations out there now. We're going to have 400 stations by spring of next year. And so it's basically going to blanket the whole city. Uh, just from a sort of a philosophical perspective, I think. You know, we would like all of the data that's not tied to a specific user uh, to be as public as possible so that folks can uh, be as creative as they want. But I think there's, you know, lots of different ways to, to play with it. I, one of the things that I want to develop, uh, I don't know, I don't know how we're going to go about doing it, but essentially it's building a model that predictably figures out when stations are going to be full and empty so that we can figure out sort of how big to make the stations based on the demand. Uh, so, yeah, and, and you know, we're continually looking for additional funding. So we could, uh, I think we'll be growing beyond the 400 stations, and we should be able to announce that pretty quickly. So, How many stations did you say you have right now? We have 70, well, we have 68 on the ground right now. And we have seven more that are in the queue. They just need to get concrete forward and things like that to put that. Put the bikes down. Uh, am I missing anything? I mean, do you guys all know how it works? Okay, so I'll just give. It's like tw you buy a 24-hour pass or a $75 annual pass, and you can use it as many times as you want without any additional charges. So each trip is on for under 30 minutes. With that, I'll just open it up to you. Yeah, after that, it's two dollars an hour. After that, it gets cost prohibitive. So short point point trips. That's what bike sharing is all about. Um, so I can walk you guys through some of the data. Uh, somebody can pop on the laptop, or I can climb. Yeah, you know. I don't So you go to the map, and this data actually, I think uh, we introduced a bit of correction. We used to have all the coming soon stations on the map. I think we pushed something out today that, that took those off. Um, so right now you don't see the up to 300 stations. But um, if you click on a station, you can see how many bikes and how many docks are available. Uh, change your URL and append slash JSON. And this, uh, I'm sorry, station, station oh. slash JSON. Uh, this is, it's not, we don't necessarily publicize the data, um, though we also don't discourage anybody from using it. Uh, we just don't publicize it yet. Um, this is, the status quo was kind of set with DC when they when they had a publicly available XML file, which is where I lived in DC and kind of got a hold of that and uh, actually built a website, cabbytracker.com, short for Capital Bike Share Tracker. And it, I was walking to work and I would notice that the station outside of my work was always full when I'm strolling at like nine or five. And when I leave early, it was you know I had some bikes in there when I left late, and so it was apparent to me that the bike that the station was being used as a commuter station, and I. Um, I uh, wanted to see what time would I have to be, would I have to get there to be guaranteed a bike. And uh, through well, many, many hours and teaching myself uh, and PHP and my skill and uh, data structures and all kinds of good stuff, uh, I realized that the time was 8.45, uh, which I probably could have just gone out the next morning and identified that. But uh, it, was a, it was a fun project to, to fill some, some idle, idle time. Um, and uh, let's see, so, so I started collecting that data. Um, there's kind of two sets of bike share data. Uh, there's the one set, which is the live, on the street, how many bikes, how many docks, let them on, uh, in service, not in service, station name, and that's pretty much all of that here. One second. Could we try to pretty print this so we can see the structure? Does anyone know how to do that on the left? Yeah, go to um, copy all of the text on the page. And then I, my favorite JSON uh, parser is. Uh, uh, Pro, P R O dot J S O N uh, L I N T. And then just paste it in that at the check mark, and then we'll see a much prettier version. Come on. So, well, what are you doing already? JSON is just a format 
for storing data. It's like an it's, it's like think of a spreadsheet. It's similar, it just does it in a, <coughs> in a different way, where it kind of gives it. It's just a different twist, but all it does is kind of give you. Oh. Okay. So everything between these little brackets is basically a row in a spreadsheet. You can think of it that way. And then you've got. Can we keep it self Thanks. And then for each kind of state, and each row, so to speak, represents a station. And these are basically the columns and the values. So you kind of have the columns stuck in to each row instead of having them at the top, but it's essentially the same thing. And so you've got um, the numerical ID of the station, the actual human friend of the name of the station, how many bikes are available, uh, and how many docks are available right now. Bikes and docks uh, are the opposite of each other. So you have a slot to put in or one uh, bike to pull out. The latitude longitude is how you can actually map that on a map. Um, and then address and a few other things here that you can probably talk about. But when we're talking about bike share data, at least the first piece he's talking about, it's literally just this. And they update it every minute. Every minute. Every minute, this that wall of text gets refreshed. And what you do to make an app work is you have a little program that says throws through, gathers a lot of data, and then basically puts it on a map. This is what we're talking about. So just think through these fields. And one such application is our website. Our website, uh, if you do a view source on the page and look at the, uh, the JavaScript, it does digest this, this information. Um, and this is really, it's great because uh, jQuery can easily parse it. Uh, PHP can really parse it. Every, like it's, everything can parse JSON pretty, pretty easily. And put it into an array, put it into a spreadsheet, however you want to digest the data. Um, so that's one set of like share data, and it's updated every minute. Uh, a lot of people like to take this data and put it into their own database to kind of get a historical standpoint of uh, what the stations look like out in the field uh, over time. That's how I got started. And uh, and then the other side of bike share data, which um, I'm not committing to right now, but I can almost, off the record, I can say record it or not, that uh, we're almost guaranteed to release the data because we do in every other city. It's really, uh, if we don't for some reason, I think it gets up to the DOT. Um, because it's really their decision. It's which data is that? That's a trip data. Oh. Uh, so that's a trip data. At the end of the quarter, which is what we do in, in other cities, we release, we, uh, we strip out all the personal information for all the trips, and we give um, start station, end station, trip duration, uh, time of day, you know, the exact date, uh, date time stamps, and um, for all the trips. So you guys can then you know follow. Oh, and the bicycle ID. So you can follow a bike around throughout the whole day. You can follow. You can't follow a customer because that's obviously. Uh, we at one point we had talked about anonymizing the customers, but then for some lower use stations, or you can kind of uh, you can get that person's anonymized ID. It's just it, it's too risky, so uh, we lose a little bit. But for if anybody is doing any kind of actual academic research uh, and needs to be able to uniquely identify, we have provided those data sets in the past. Yeah, at least one of the one of the interesting things is not quite ready yet, but each bike is equipped with a passive GPS, and so in other cities where uh, and it's not going to be available immediately as we start to test and validate and all that stuff, but it'll show the actual route people are taking. And so it'll be great for us for planning purposes to figure out are we putting the bike routes in the same spot. I would say that, you know, gray is a real issue in terms of the, the route people select for the only hills we have here are bridges. What does gray be? Gray, like the grade of the roadway. Like is it going up at Oler Valley Hill? Uh, which people actually use as a way to navigate the city. So. And this data set is really popular for lots of people across a lot of industries because it's a structured bike data. And there are, unless you're, you know, put funds out to count bikes, you don't really have a lot of good bike data. Uh, Strava, I know, recently is either releasing or I know they're collecting tons and tons of data. Um, so that's another, we're, we're starting to get some real good bike data, which is just great, even better than bike lanes. So like buses, where we have GPS on the buses, or cars, where people are signing on GPS. Exactly. You're saying it's right back to track bikes. Exactly. So, yeah. Uh, just did itself, like, exposes historical information about the historical versions of this yeah. No, we don't. We don't warehouse any of this stuff. Uh, we don't, well, we do, but it's not publicly available yet. Uh, I my, my personal site that I developed for DC and then changed to make work in Boston and created copies for New York and, and, and TV uh, here in Chicago. Um, those are publicly available right now. I can jump on and show you guys what I've done. Uh, maybe later, I don't, I don't want to monopolize time. 
Um, but maybe when we kind of break out or, or do some demos, I can show you. But we don't do any publicly available. Uh, we don't, we don't but you are also saving that data. We save the data, yeah, because we use it operationally. I can look at that exact station and tell you, uh, on average, how many bikes and docks are available across weekdays, weekends, um, you know, what time span, what time frame. It, it, we what kind of analysis do you guys do in analysis and for what purpose? You can, never too, you can never do too much, right? Um, so with that, I guess we do not enough. Um, <laughs> because, I mean, we could, have, we could have everybody in this room employed by uh, our organization digest and bike data and, and still feel like there's, there's more that we can do. Um, at this point, we're, uh, we're trying to get the system uh, operational, fully functional, and uh, to, to full satisfaction. Yeah, but that, one of the key problems with bike share is that you get this problem of like, if a lot of people are, want to go in one direction at a time of day, you have a lot of empty docks over here, a lot of empty stations over here, a lot of overfull stations over here. For it to work, if you think about it, you always want to have at least one bike there or at least one uh, dock there so you can either, you know, if you're driving, if you're biking, you can deposit your bike or you can pull, pull one out if you want to take it. So there's this thing called rebalancing, right, where you actually have trucks manually take these things, move them to other stations. How do you currently figure out how to do that? Uh, well, so right now, New York uh, kind of blazes away for you guys. Uh, the, the, the commuter trends are starting to emerge in New York. Um, the peripheral of Manhattan uh, is, is generally considered, um, based on the data, I call it the neighborhoods. And then the kind of downtown or central core is more of uh, the business district. So in DC, you've got all the neighborhoods. And then you've got a downtown central core. Everybody rides down and everybody rides back out. It's very simple to understand. You can almost draw it on a map. There are certain stations like DuPont Circle that has a kind of self-balancing, lots of in and lots of out. Um, so we don't really have enough data yet to see what, what, how people are going to use the system in Chicago. Uh, but as, it, as we go forward, we can individually look at each system, I mean, at, at each station and identify what it looks like throughout the day and uh, kind of label it in our minds as this way or that way. Uh, we also have um, pending. We have we can see our balancing trucks on the map and kind of route them. And we have uh, we also do some other operational things like uh, change out the batteries when they're low, or if the station for some reason disconnects because of a cell outage or a, some other reason. Uh, we have all that data. What about? I mean, one of the things that I worry about with, with signing up is what if I what if I get to work and now all all of the docking stations are full. I mean, uh, so how are you keep? Is there any way? Have you guys put in any way for a for a customer to say, "I'd love to dock this bike, but your station is full." So there's um, several answers to this question. Uh, first and foremost, if you get to a station that's full, you can um, through some function in the kiosk, and I don't know exactly what it is. I I do all I do this well some of this website. I, mean, uh, I don't do a lot of the, the kiosk stuff. I'm not a station tech at all. I don't do the training and stuff. Um, but there's a function on the kiosk where you can get more time. And that, if the station's full, it says, OK, you can have 15 more minutes. And that enables you to ride to another station that uh, without incurring any extra charges. Can I give you an idea? This is maybe a, a point that you're going to get at. So combining this and the earlier question, there's something in call centers called that they use for model staffing called an Erlang calculator. And it basically, you get call duration, call volume, all that stuff, and you put it into a model that spits on the staff you need. Something like this, you know, how many trips are going into the station, how long it is between each docking and undocking. And somebody way smarter than me can build a model that basically tells you, A, how many docks you need. They have some degree of confidence that there's always going to be a dock that there's going to be a bike. In addition to that, that's sort of the first question something that you're talking about, you could basically build an app, like take the app that we have to the next level and give predictive information on when that dock's going to free up. So you you know how it's full now, but you can say based on the standard activity of this station at this time, there's a 99% chance it's going to free up within 30 seconds or 2 minutes or 15 minutes. So it can help the city on the planning side and the users. Yeah, exactly. And, that, and that's really why we're all here. to. to take these problems and these challenges and, and try to address them. So the other two answers to your question are, um, so one is you can get more time and go to another station. Um, two is, 
sometimes after, say, leaving the game or something uh, when I was in DC and Metro is full. And I had to wait for the next one. I couldn't, there was nothing I could do. It just, it's used beyond its capacity. Uh, it's a public good. There's not much more that you can do besides say, well, <laughs> that's what we get. You know, that's, that's, that's what happens. Um, so sometimes uh, waiting or, or knowing kind of the patterns or, and also kind of knowing the system. A lot of times we'll have, like in DuPont Circle, if the, and in DC, if that one fills up, there's one kind of around the corner that's lesser used. It's a newer station. Uh, some people don't know about it. And it's not right there, right on the peripheral of, of, of DuPont Circle. So kind of knowing the system and, and, and having the app and seeing the device station. So the map off right on, isn't it? What's that? Yeah, and there's also a map on the kiosk to tell you all the nearby stations. And I, I want to say when you do get more time, I think there's another function that says give me all the nearby stations. Uh, so there's a couple of, it's a problem. Uh, it's a problem, but it's a good problem to have because it means people are using the system. Chattanooga doesn't have this problem. Uh, can we turn the mic off? <laughs> uh, Chattanooga, I don't think, has this problem as much. And I don't think Melbourne has this problem as much because their systems aren't nearly as widely used as Chicago, Boston, and uh, DC. Thank you. Yes. Um, so, <clears throat> So I live in the Hyde Park. Is there any, as it seems like a lot of people do here, um, is there any plan or like intention? So it says on the website from Andersonville to Hyde Park, and there are looks like there are stops close to Andersonville, but there's actually no no kiosks south of McCormick Place. Turn the map that was there. Is there a plan or intention? So right now we've got in the south 75. Side? give or take, uh, systems on the ground right now. Mm -hmm. uh, as I understand it, we're going to do some stations in July, and then dates to be announced. And I believe we're going to do about another 75 in July. Uh, the goal is to get up to 300, and eventually well beyond that. Okay. Um, so it, it, if I'm sad that we don't have the planned stations up on, on the map right, right now. Um, but I have that data, and I can tell you all of the plan stations that right now are subject to change, but there's a pretty good idea, and, and you can see, I'll actually try to do it here, and then we can, um, you, you can tell me, you know, there's... Yeah, that would be great. Um, I mean, it's interesting, because, like, the access to public transportation is worse, is worse, is, like, the worst in the city on the south side, so, um, like, trains, especially the closing of the red line, so it'd be great if there's access to other alternative forms of public transit, um, all of, like, affordable transit, so... It's basically going to go all the way down to 63rd Street. Right now, not south of there. Not south. Yeah, I mean, our goal is to grow south, like in more basically to spread out like a new map. Right. But <laughs> it'll get to High Park. I think we have 12 or 15 stations coming through. It's sort of a 10-wood High Park. Sorry. But you do bring up an excellent point of, and I don't know <laughs> the red line, is, is it closed for good or is it temporary? It's closed for a year. It's still it's closed. closed. It's closed. It's closed. It's closed. So in New York, they did kind of the same thing with G-Trains closing for the summer. And um, they were entertaining, and I don't know what the, what the latest of this is, they were entertaining just putting a bunch of bike share stations all throughout the area uh, to basically backfill the absence of the G-Train. Yeah, the G-Train, the G I mean, relative to the other subway lines, the G-Train carries three people between, between Queens and Brooklyn. Right. It's not right. the red line is the 63rd, actually. There is no way we can put out enough bikes. I did a count this morning and there were 650-ish bikes out of the street right now, 611. It's about 10, 10 bikes for every station and then you keep generally about 10% of the bikes there, just you know, in case the bike breaks down or things like that. This is um, this one. This is sort of a good segue. This is an app that this guy um, Dude, Oliver Peter O'Brien. Yeah, he made this cost. Yeah, he's done it for a bunch of cities. Now. He's done it for every single city. Yeah, and, and you this can, is a great little dashboard showing you. Uh, it's using this exact same thing, right? Yeah, yeah to, exactly. To pull yep. pop into this map. Stephen, are you going to talk about applications? Yes. Okay. So when, yeah, so we'll oh yeah. Sorry. So good transition. Yeah. Another question. Oh, I was just saying.